Welcome and thank you for joining us in the pre-conference thematic track one, creating new societal vision in higher education, values for living together. In the framework of the international online conference, building new bridges together, strengthening ethics in higher education, developed by Globetics.net. My name is Maria Eugenia Barroso. I am the executive program of Globetics South America, and I will be moderating this meeting. This meeting is being recorded and I will be posted on Globetic.net. Please remember to mute your microphone where you are not speaking and unmute it when you want to speak. In this pre-conference, four panelists will be sharing their visions from the different areas of specialization and context. It is a honor to have with us Mr. Wirwahi Eugene Wirba from Cameroon and Kenya, lecturer at the Catholic University East Asia. He teaches ethics of uh, peace building and development. Dr. Suprama Chakraborty from India, head of the Department of Humanity, Heritage Institute of Technology, Calcutta, India, co author of the book Values and Ethics in Business and Profession. Dr. Rudolf von Sinner, Swiss naturalized Swiss a Brazilian. He is professor and coordinator of the graduate program in theology at the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná in Curitiba. He is a member of Globet Foundation Board. And Dr. Fiona Robertson from the United Kingdom. She's senior lecturer of accounting and finance leads at the, sorry at Leeds Beck University. Thank you for being uh, with us today. The structure of the meeting will be the following. Each speaker will have seven minutes to expose. After each presentation, it will be a slot for question and answers. Uh, so we invite you and encourage you to participate and make your question using the chat box. Christine Housel from Globetis will be collecting the question and read them to the, particip uh, to the speakers. After the presentation of Dr. Uh, Suprana Chakaborty, Regulia Bid from Globetics will be highlighting and summarizing silent points and observation from the presentation. Uh, higher education as a society is rapidly changing. Concurrent trends can be observed between quantification, streamlining of higher education, like as ranking, outcome orientation, and intentional or international orientation toward competence and character formation. But what role can ethics play in preserving the qualitative perfect perspective in higher education? What are the actual challenges and vision for higher education as societies emerge from the pandemic? How can higher education look like serve, to serve living together in a plural societies? What kind of societal goals can higher education consider in designing curricula, in preparing the next generation of professional, responsible citizens and leaders? The presentation of our panelists will try to highlight up those and another questions. Please let me introduce Wirwahi Eugene Wirwa. He will present pandemics toward a global health ethics for impending pandemics in the 21st century. Eugene, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm very happy to be part of this uh, great team of Globetics uh, to present this proposal of pandemics towards a global health ethics for impending pandemics in the 21st century. Um, as I've been rightly introduced, um, I'm a lecturer, the adjunct lecturer at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. Uh, where I teach, among other things, ethics of uh, development and peace building. Um, so let me just go straight to the to the topic. Uh, why I brought this uh, proposal here and pandemics simply suggest um, 
it comes from pandemic and ethics, so that should be obvious. Uh, okay, yes, it's being projected. <clears throat> to suggest an ethics that can inform pandemics in the way that just what theory was preemptive and prescriptive and as such would be applied ethics. We know humanitarian ethics has been developed from uh, just war ethics. So I have two aims. Why should we focus on, pandemi on, on pandemics? And how do we create uh, a societal vision for living together? So those two questions is what I will be trying to focus on today. Uh, in the other conference, I will give a way forward. Uh, the 20th, the 20th century was marked by world wars, and that was the security threat. And it is against that background that we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, the First World War, the Second World War, and then the, the, the UN came against the backdrop of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it has been improving, it has been helping us to define what are human rights, whether they are political, whether they are social, okay? But when looking at the 21st century, we see that it has, it began with diseases, okay? Uh, this century began with severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS in 2002, Ebola, which was discovered in 1979, continued to resurface in many parts of West and Central Africa. And last week, actually, there was Ebola in DRC Congo. But uh, we know how it affected the world in 2014. Um, there has also been H1N1 flu in 2009. And what um, runs across is that we are not prepared for uh, a uh, uh, contacting pan for for responding to pandemics, uh, whether as a security sector, whether as a society, <clears throat> due to the experience of COVID nineteen, we have seen different sectors have come up with different initiatives to examine the impact. We are already talking of impact, uh, but we need to go to the causes, uh, which is a story for another day. But this research proposes pandemics as a subfield of applied ethics that would synthesize this initiative and lessons learned by analyzing ethical dilemma, dilemmas experienced during the pandemic. Okay, the implication is that we shall have a proactive framework for dealing with pandemics, which are highly likely to form most of the 21st century. Why global pandemic? Why global pandemic? Why pandemics? Okay, global security sector is far from being guaranteed. So uh, we have talked. I've mentioned those diseases. The second reason is that infectious pandemics are likely to increase from our carelessness with the use of antibiotics, from uh, our carelessness of consuming wildlife. You know, we know COVID nineteen has been linked to pangolins and so on, or bats increased scientific exploration on viruses and bacteria in laboratories around the world for pure experimentation or as um, bioweapons, okay? And in all, all this, we are seeing globalization retreating, but it is going to, uh, it's just retreating and we cannot uh, uh, undermine our interconnectedness. We are going to, continue re interacting hereafter. So we are proposing uh, something which would be for the 21st century. We have seen, uh, during this period, we have seen the abuse of executive and uh, military powers during the COVID-19 because <clears throat> we don't have that precedence. Uh, all these are the risks of uh, the citizens. We have also seen conspiracy theory, fake news, that have caused uh, more harm. Uh, we see all this in our WhatsApp and we, it's very easy to forward false information which people can panic. It's very easy to say, this is the cure for COVID-19. It's very easy to say, this is not real. So pandemics, like um, any other sub-branch of ethics, is not aimed at being prescriptive per se, but it aims at guiding reasons such that people and stakeholders and policymakers can make informed uh, decisions. 
So let me look at the second part, uh, creating societal vision <clears throat> in higher education, values for living together. So um, if you look at my, my, my humble submission here is that we need to go back to the rhetorics of human dignity that has already been explored by people uh, of all religions. In, the, in Christianity, we talk about created in the human, uh, in the image and likeness of God. In Africa, we have Ubuntu philosophy, which means I am because we are. And this had helped in, the, in, in coming up with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So a true realization of human rights must be mutual, equal, reciprocal, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and reciprocal in our communal life and not just individually. Pandemics would be applied ethics that synthesizes lessons learned from COVID-19, SARS, Ebola, HIV, and proposed conduct during, uh, before, during, and after pandemics. And this could be useful also for any epidemics. Ethics has defined humanitarian law, and we should not be shy from using a rhetoric like pandemics. Uh, it will not just be another boost word. Uh, such as human development, but we, we know that these boost words from academy, uh, from the academicians and practitioners do help policy. So it's time for us to start thinking of pandemics, um, to synthesize experiences of ethical issues experienced during the period of COVID-19, bringing together all uh, actors through a multidisciplinary approach uh, that would begin forging new alliances between higher education and societal actors. I end there and we can have more discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for introducing the concept of uh, pandemics. And we have a, a minute for questions. Christine, a household donor relations and strategic partnerships at Globetics has collected and will read for you, Jim. Thank you, Christine, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Eugenia. Hello, everyone. Question from Dr. Zohair Gadiali from India about how are differently abled patients able to manage this deficiency, the deficiency being that they are often forgotten during pandemics. And while this is being responded to, please everyone feel free to put in your own comments and questions into the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we if if we really have this common vision, which we talk about a life of dignity for all, then we see we will not leave anybody behind. This has been the rhetoric of human development. Uh, so long as we have a same vision of humanity, that we are all con interconnected, that we are all, uh, uh, we all have a common humanity, then we can have that vision. But you, you realize the, uh, there are people who don't have this, share this same vision, and that is shown in racism we are seeing, it is shown in uh, clan, clanism, um, um, it is also shown in class struggle in other places. So that is why we are, uh, as people in ethics, we need to forge this vision of humanity. Who are we? So it is a question of who are we as human beings? Once we answer that, then we can define what uh, uh, society is for us because we, not, we are not just as individuals, but we are social beings, we are interconnected, and we shall remain social beings. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Adis Amando. Why is there still a lack of preparedness despite the past experiences in HIV and AIDS, Ebola, Spanish flu long ago in 1919, I think? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, and these are things which we really need to, to I, I don't have all the answers for this, but we know uh, that if all these pandemics have been affecting everyone, 
as we see with COVID-19, uh, top personalities have been affected. Then there is some sort of action being taken. But so long as it is Ebola happening in Africa or in China, we keep thinking that it's not going to uh, affect me. Then we don't have uh, 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 the political will to start preparing for the next pandemic. So. Uh, <clears throat> It's a matter of having a political will. It's a matter of knowing that anybody can be affected. Um, and, and we need to inquire more uh, why people are still taking it uh, lightly, pandem uh, pandemics and epidemics so lightly. Uh, uh, in the world, it is a leveling ground. Uh, COVID-19 has shown it's a leveling ground for all humanity. Let me, um, let me read the next set of questions, and this will be where we end. And I invite you, um, Mr. Eugene Wirka, to just choose, choose one or two points that you'd like to respond to as we have just a minute or two left, and the dialogue will continue. So let me just read through. Mary Roche asks, are just war and the militaristic metaphors the only or best frameworks for pandemethics? What does pandemic peace building look like? Daniel Lopez Salor or Salort says the common point of view is the defense of human rights, but what about social actors? Because we are educators. Uh -huh. And um, pandemethics is not out there to, to prescribe, but to help decision makers make informed decisions according to your proposal. Isn't that view wishful thinking as world leaders have their own agendas, which may differ from public well-being? And we also have uh, a comment about a challenge in Asian cultures where living together in proximity and space of time is a value. How do we deal with a pandemic where social distancing becomes the normal? And we, we, we go into World Health Organization and multilateral organizations as well. So I invite you to choose one or two points to respond to now, and, and then we continue on. OK, thank you so much. Um, uh, um, just War is not uh, the only way of thinking about pandemics, but Just War has a way of looking at the situation. What can we do before? during and after. So that is just the framework I'm taking. And what I also know is that it is not just wishful thinking because a just war theory has helped in the practice. When we talk about uh, war crimes, they have come from the war, uh, just war theories and about um, what people have been suggesting, what academicians or theorists like St. Augustine, uh, from a long time ago, St. Thomas Aquinas, they have been talking about what can be done. So as academician, we, uh, I'm just bringing just what to look at parallels which we can. Yes, some people will say it is wishful thinking, but as we have seen, uh, we human beings, uh, part of being human is to use language, is to be rhetorical, and we can use uh, what we are convinced. We are not just giving wishful thinking we are thinking that a pandemics would improve the dignity of human beings so we can bring a rhetoric that <clears throat> can help us to examine these issues social distancing there are dilemmas there but we need to know we need to ask ourselves is it for human dignity because like where i come from where i am in nairobi uh, social distance could be a problem because people need to go out and get food either they will die in their house or so so these are things that uh, a pandemic would try to highlight and make governments and policymakers to be prepared for the next pandemic yes the the who has international um uh, uh, regulation framework which was developed and passed in 2007 but it has not been uh, implemented and even when the WHO is giving proposals as academicians we need to make some rhetoric such that it can harness and synthesize all what is happening around pandemics such that we can be prepared because sometimes governments are making just rational decisions based on uh, what will happen 
based on the, the economy. Uh, I've seen in the call the interconnectedness between economy and, 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 and politics is so strong. So we need to stand out and come out with something that will start having a discussion with policymakers um, from all the social sphere. Yes, and, 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 what, and one last thing, uh, I know there is a difference between looking at health in America and in Europe. In America, health is a, a security issue, and in most of Europe, health is a social issue. As you can see, the 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 the, the NHS in, in 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 Britain working on a kind of social basis, but in America, it is a, a security issue. So we need to bring this together and see because it is already a threat to humanity uh, to synthesize and see. Uh, uh, what can work for all. Okay. Thank you, Jean, for your uh, for answering the questions. And thank you, uh, Christine. We are going with our next panelist. Uh, she is Suprana Chakaborty. She will expose towards inclusiveness through knowledge and compassion. Welcome, Soprana, and you have the floor. Well, good evening and welcome. Since this is a discussion forum, so I will simply try to put my three points, which I think are the actions to be taken to build up values for togetherness. That is what we are trying to do. And the topic which I sent for you all was towards inclusiveness through knowledge and compassion. You know, I teach in an engineering college and I'm the head of the humanities department where apart from language courses and management courses, ethics course is a compulsory course uh, for the students. And there I've been teaching ethics uh, for the past 10 years or so, and I've co-authored a book also. And this, your topic, this togetherness started, you know, a chain reaction in me and I started thinking that what am I doing and what are the changes, the collective measures that we should be taking? I'm sharing three steps which I thought we should be taking and I am I have joined this forum only because I want your input whether what I'm thinking can be implementable or not I plan to Im implement it the moment the college reopens but still your input will be helpful for, for me the first thing that we need to understand is you see that when learners come to institutions like this engineering colleges and all they come as degree seekers actually they are they are there for degree seekers and they have come here to enhance their livelihood earning capabilities that is the ground reality i'm talking from india a state west bengal and a city kolkata and the basic change that i have felt that has to be made is that we have to somewhere you know build in that these learners apart from degree seekers become change makers in their own area of work which at the moment they are not being trained to do they are very very competitive they are very focused towards their career which is good which is not bad but somewhere we are leaving away for example if i tell you the first step that i've thought about is a change in the course design at present, the course which I'm teaching, Engineering Ethics, the whole course is designed, you know, at making the learners aware about professional ethics. That, and we train them. What is modality? What are the professional code of conduct? For engineers only, it is so focused. And so that the aim is that when they go to their workplace, when they join their workplace, they have ethical tool to implement while decision making processes going on. That is all we do. And it works. I have I have talked to my ex-students and they sometimes come back to me and tell, ma'am, what you taught, you know, we realize that yes, at workplace this happens and so on and so forth. Little bit of so ethical training we do manage to give, which they implement at their workplace. But I this your your conference you know, made a chain reaction and when we started thinking that now, I think I will design a course, I will tweak it a little bit so that I 
build the an awareness within them about the world around them they are not aware of the world around them they are uh, they are aware if they have to know gk questions they know yes they are high into data mining uh, artificial intelligence all that they are they are doing that is their world the globalized world has led them to know to seek knowledge as such but they are not aware of the world which is beyond them they are not aware so one basic course change in the second point that i'm trying to say is research at grassroots level you know when we have been doing research it was the pursuit of knowledge and for pleasure's sake we enjoyed doing doing it but now i think the the pleasure portion has to be changed to utility one what is the utility of the research which i'm which i'm doing and my students are doing a lot of research global topics but no one is doing a research in the grassroots level for example i'll tell, tell you in west west bengal jute is there jute cultivation happens there is one or two institutes where research is going on there others are not not bothered because we can use jute for packaging and all which can generate employment which can alleviate poverty no one is bothered the third point that and this is very very difficult to achieve that is what i personally feel it is developing empathy and compassion among our learners this is really difficult and what i have thought for the past two days is that we have to have social projects and movements if you ask me i have rarely met a disabled person because no one is there in my family i don't know them they are there some donation yes i give but i don't empathize with them i don't know them i have never had a dialogue with them i think the same is there with my with my students too with my learners too so here a major shift has to be brought you know the social movement transgenders we have no clue i have watched some documentary but that's all so this is the third and here i'm sure there will be a lot of hurdles opposition i'm sure many parents will come and tell me ma'am i don't want my my uh, you know students my children to go with you on a pro project this this one to one you know we have segregated one society the disabled ones and the others during this pandemic too my life is only not un not affected only the only point is that i am staying at home and i've learned how to teach online and all that's all and i'm happy with it Thank you, Suparna, for your contributions. And listen now to Rajula. Mm -hmm. Please, Rajula, you have the floor. Special greetings from Bangalore, India. And I'm extremely happy to listen to Suparna Ji, who is also from India. And it's an honor for me to give a kind of summary of both the panelists and also if there is any special concern to put forward some questions. And uh, uh, both the panelists, my special heartfelt thanks. They have worked very hard. They have done it very well. It was brilliant, both the presentations. And uh, with regard to uh, 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 Dr. Virkwaje Eugene, uh, he actually focused on the theme pandemics towards a global health ethics for inventing pandemics in the 21st century and uh, uh, this is actually uh, what is happening around the world and uh, immediate need also need of the hour he explained uh, what is pandemics and why it is pandemics and also he explained the need to create a societal vision that is achievable and uh, he also highlighted the different viral infection that has been happening uh, from the beginning of 21st uh, century, which is never uh, pleasant to, uh, uh, to anyone. And uh, it has happened in different parts of the world, which also he actually highlighted. And uh, after that, he explained about the methods used to measure the impact. And after that, he explained why global pandemics. Under this, he explained about how the disease has been misused by executives and also military powers. After this, he explained about ways through which pandemics could be achieved. And finally, he highlighted uh, the need to bring together our experience in achieving pandemics. And uh, it was followed by floor discussion. 
and uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Subarna. I'm extremely happy that she is working in an engineering college and uh, she actually uh, spoke from her heart, the thirst that uh, she has in her heart, I could actually understood, understand from her talk. And she highlighted three points and three major shifts she is expecting that should happen uh, in educational institution, mainly from Indian education, higher, higher, Indian higher education institution point of view. The first one, she spoke about uh, uh, the students who come into the college only as a degree seekers and uh, she felt that uh, there should be a change in the course designing, which is highly professional, not ethical. And uh, the second point that she mentioned was research at grassroots level. Uh, it is happening uh, and the students are not serious about what they are doing, mostly for degree sake and it is not utilized the knowledge which they acquire through their research it is not utilized properly that is her concern and the last point was uh, she stressed for a need to develop empathy and compassion among the learners and uh, along with this uh, i would like to put uh, three questions based on my listening from both the panelists and also the way moderator has started I have three special concerns. One is related with the main theme and uh, both the speakers one one. And uh, first I would like to explain the context. In a way, COVID-19 has built a new bridge between the haves and have nots, the white and the black, the educated and the unlettered by affecting all without any discrimination or difference. So for this, the question is from this, how can higher education tell the younger generation that understanding the equality of humans is very vital. How can this be used to create a new societal vision? And uh, moving on to the next one, COVID-19 affected different societies in different ways. There is no vaccine, medicine, medical facilities, and also medical understanding of the disease. So my question here is, in this context, how can higher education promote universal understanding of viral infections how can we build an ethically sound humanity that offers to help each other and i'm moving on to the last one covid 19 has given rise to some very special socio-ethical issues tens of thousands of migrant laborers in india lost their jobs due to lockdown they had no transportation to get back to their native place so with their belongings and family, they walked thousands of miles to reach their native places. They suffered hunger and pain and also death and separation. So my question here is, how can higher education institutions in India become centers and practitioners of ethical values, producing a generation of people who will be ready to help the humanity in times of such needs? Thank you very much, Rajula, for summarizing the key points of the speakers and uh, Rajula is a program executive of Globetics in India and now move on uh, our third panelist uh, he is Rudolf von Sinner he will present contribution of a confessional university for society thank you Rudolf for participating and you have the floor Muchas gracias, Eugenia. thank you very much uh, and from this side of the globe it is good morning to all of you uh, it's good to meet you and be able to interact with you. What I want to present is a kind of case study as I reflect on my own university. How do we, uh, from our principles in our actions and also from our motivations, contribute uh, to the present uh, crisis? And I will try to share with you a um, uh, presentation. The Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná at Curitiba, Brazil, PUC as we call it, is a Catholic private non-profit philanthropic communitarian university run by the Marista Religious Congregation, fully accredited by state authorities and open to all faiths, um, sorry, all faiths and those who profess none. I myself am a professor and head of a postgraduate program being a Lutheran, which is not a common thing to occur in theology in Catholic universities. Of course, in other study programs, there are all kinds of faiths and convictions. So why to be Catholic is by no means a precondition to enter the university, be it as a student, as administrative staff, or as faculty. 
The identity can be felt quite clearly through our teaching, research, and outreach. Hook currently has about 20,000 students in over 60 undergraduate and 16 graduate programs. Among its goals are, and I quote, those who are most relevant to ethics, which is to promote intellectual, physical, artistic, civilian, moral, and spiritual culture, to prepare professionals with a solid humanistic formation, notable by their knowledge, capable on an efficient exercise of their tasks, and and role with a sense of social responsibility and citizenship, and to contribute towards the development of society. These values show that the university is very clear on its goals for education and formation, which go far beyond the ingestion of knowledge in its more restricted sense, than carrying education, as Paulo Freire at the time called it. Formation is for so social responsible citizens that are committed towards developing and transforming society. And I shall briefly present what this could mean in three theses. Uh, the first one is science is not done in an ivory tower, which is the practice of science, we could say. Hook is oriented by ethical Christian and Marista values and has as its mission to develop and spread knowledge and a culture of promoting integral and ongoing formation of citizens and of professionals committed to life and to the progress of society. Its motto is, as you can see in the coat of arms, Scientia Vita et Fides, Science, Life and Faith, which we can explain as the articulation between the practice of science, the impact on life, and the meaning provided by and the motivation through faith. Hook seeks to promote dialogue between science, faith and culture and life and solidarity, forming professionals that are conscious of their human vocation in whatever they do, being guided by ethical principles. Science is thus never on its own, but responds to demands from society and addresses the needs for meaningful transformation. This is obviously especially needed in an emerging country like Brazil, which has enormous social disparities and many precarities of daily life that need to be addressed and solved. The second thesis is there are distinct tasks, but there is mutual fecundation and cooperation between sciences, Wissenschaften, that is the impact on life they uh, get together to provide. Since I joined PUC last year, after 16 years of working at the Lutheran Theological Seminary, I have noted that there is a great interest and willingness to cooperate between the different areas, the various sciences. I call all of them sciences in the German sense of Wissenschaften, that includes the humanities as sciences, rather than uh, referring to the Anglo-Saxon distinction between science and humanity. Such cooperation driven by fulfilling the mission is driven by fulfilling the mission of fostering humanity and serving society and has become even more tangible as the pandemic presses for an immediate response. Health sciences found out details about how the virus functions and what this implies for correct treatment. Too much ventilation by the respiration machine can damage the lungs and anticoagulation drugs must be applied to avoid embolism. Health technology, together with design, developed simple, cheap, but effective individual protection gear for health professionals, like shields and masks and so on, and is providing these to the two university hospitals. The humanities, namely philosophy, theology, education, as well as human rights and public policies, are contributing with reflections and online presentations on the human being in times of COVID-19, what it means to have hope in such times, and the need for spiritual assistance of health personnel and other frank workers that are usually forgive, uh, forgotten, like grave diggers. The vice director for mission, identity and outreach is working closely with community leaders in the nearby slum and providing basic food items, shelter and spiritual assistance. He regularly interacts with the academic community to express gratitude, to inspire hope and trust and strengthen commitment. The vice director for research, postgraduate studies at innovation, you can see her uh, on the photograph, with colleagues from artificial intelligence and urban management, developed an algorithm that allows to reasonably predict, based on data from the past days and weeks, the curve of infections and deaths of the next week or two, predicting the occupation of intensive care unit beds and thus the degree of lockdown needed. 
Yesterday's local TV journal has presented this as an important contribution towards public policy and transparent information and uh, prediction. And you see on the next slide an image uh, of our um, traffic light, which indicates how serious uh, and how much lockdown is in the situation, how much lockdown is needed. We are now in the orange moment. And my third and last thesis is that science is knowledge and wisdom, meaning and motivation through faith. The biblical tradition in the Hebrew Bible, as well as in Jesus' teaching and acting, says a lot about wisdom, which is put in a simple formula to know how to live. While technical and specific knowledge is needed towards this end, it is also experience and the wisdom how to deal with everyday life that has to be valued and fostered through teaching and empowerment within and beyond the university. Therefore, the whole academic community has been working tirelessly towards finding technological solutions as well as harvesting and showing examples of concrete solidarity that give meaning and are motivated by faith and convictions in teaching, research and outreach. The practice of science, the impact on life and the meaning provided by and the motivation through faith are the three theses I wanted to present to you for our sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rudolf, for your contribution. Thank you for inviting us to reflect about science. It's not done in an ivory tower, and there are different tasks by mutual fertilization between the science. And finally, to uh, the interaction or the describing the science uh, like uh, knowledge and wisdom. I will like I would like to result or highlight the the the, the concept of fostering humanity and work closely with the society. Thank you for, for this uh, space of reflection and we move on with the next uh, speaker. Uh, our four panelists is Dr. Fiona Robertson. Uh, she will present integrating reporting in higher education. Uh, and previously to have uh, heard the floor, I remember the audience to uh, make the question using the chat box and uh, to continue with the, the fruitful dialogue. Thank you. And Fiona, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. And good afternoon from here in the UK. And thank you, Emily, for inviting me to share in this very insightful conference so far and some great speakers. I've learned a lot in this short space of time. And I'm delighted to, to be able to share with you my thoughts on a subject that I'm passionate about on integrated reporting in higher education. An organisation that is a narrow view based on profit and financial capital alone fails to mitigate its risks and realise its opportunities. Many enlightened organisations are there for shifting the focus from considering just profit for the organization itself and its owners to shared value based on the premise that sustainable development requires the recognition that the three dimensions of sustainable development, the economy, society and the environment are indivisible and integrated. Integrated reporting itself is both an output in the form of an integrated report and a process in the form of integrated thinking. So its key concepts are value creation using a multiple capital model that envisages economic, financial, uh, economic, societal and environmental issues. Integrated thinking through collaboration across functions to consider the business model within businesses and universities and identify trade-offs in the different capitals and longer term strategic planning. This value creation statement is from Edinburgh University, one of the very few universities globally that has adopted integrated reporting. It shows how Edinburgh University makes an impact in society in the areas of people, knowledge, networks and relationships, and natural resources. 
universities have significant influence over a large proportion of the world's future leaders and have the potential to make one of the biggest impacts of any sector through sustainability reporting and education and stand to be among the biggest beneficiaries of integrated thinking and integrated reporting. In contrast to efforts to develop integrated thinking in the corporate world, university structures and strategies continue to reflect functional and disciplinary silos, notwithstanding some admirable attempts to develop interdisciplinary research and a separation of the academic from the operational. A particular impetus for the change comes from governments around the world committed to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Universities are central to achievement of these 17 goals and governments may hold them accountable for making a contribution. In particular, universities contribute to solving the world's challenges, many of which we've talked about today, and improving future workforce skills. At a time when people and the planet face challenges from pandemics, digitization, overpopulation, climate change, deforestation, urbanization, poverty, income inequity, the, you know, the problems go on and on. These are important contributions. But few universities, strategies, explicitly incorporate many, if any of these considerations into their strategy or report on their outcomes. According to research, integrated reporting leads to increased understanding of value creation, improvements in decision making, greater focus in measuring the longer term success of an organisation, and it enables organisations like universities to better understand the impact in society of their strategic choices enabling them to improve the allocation of resources across all stakeholder groups to optimize collective value and to ensure strategy is aligned, aligned to societal needs as a whole. Gaining top management support is essential for integrated reporting and integrated thinking adoption. Therefore, successful leaders of the future need to be equipped with the right education and training to ensure that they're able to influence and change the path that people and organizations take to ensure that future development is done sustainably to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Millennials are estimated to exceed 2 billion around the world accounted for 27% of the adult population in the US and 24% in Europe. Millennials make up the biggest generation in US history, even larger than the baby boom organization of which I belong. Numerous studies have concluded that millennials demand transparency about how the products and services that they consume impact on the planet and their own well-being making it more important for organizations of the future to demonstrate their positive impacts in society and the environment if they want to attract and retain customers, students, investors, talent, etc. I'm involved in an Erasmus project called ISSUE, Innovative Solutions for Sustainability in Higher Education, where a team of universities in the UK, Spain, Hungary, Germany, Finland and Slovenia have developed training initiatives such as training to implement integrated reporting in universities which the UK team including myself were involved in and initial reports and learnings are starting to emerge with the development of a, an escape room in Budapest, a spaceship and a 21 day challenge initiative based on the sustainable development goals designed to change mindsets of the future. The aim of these innovative initiatives is to inform tomorrow's leaders of the challenges of the future 
and to equip them with the tools to meet those challenges. According to Mark Twain, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Make sure that you make a difference by being part of making changes that will ensure that the initiatives such as integrated reporting are developed in higher education to safeguard our future economy, to protect our future environment and to create a better future for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, for your contribution. Uh, now, Christine will provide a sum, um, so I will summarize some key points of the last um, presentations. And we encourage you during this time to use the chat box for more questions for the panelists, for each or for every one of them. Uh, don't limit to the last one you can use and to go uh, to the principle of the conversation. Thank you very much. Most of the rich comments um, are indeed comments. And I think we see a certain consensus in the conversation, which is really very interesting. Um, so we, we see non attributed here, but just a few summary comments. Um, we like the idea of degree seekers to change makers. So education, education for life, not just education for a living, should be the motto of higher education institutions. We need education for a living, but it's education for life. Um, there's a question of how, um, how faith and education relate to each other, to how it could or how it does or how it should to produce ethical graduates and the, the question of values, um, how, the values of empathy, inclusiveness and connectedness are coming forward with our speakers and in our chat. There's a question of how in fact do we inculcate those values today, knowing it's difficult at all times and especially today when many, face, many students are, are kind of confined to their homes or uh, and face-to-face -face contact is limited um, limited these days. Um, and there has been a suggestion that the need of the hour is, is the change in the education system. And this would certainly be the proposal um, with which GlobeEthics.net comes forward with this conference and gathers this rich conversation that education is a key factor in the transformation that we all want to see. And the comment is that it's difficult to achieve unless planned systematically and with proper vision. So our goal here is to, um, to gather together to, to, to explore just how to do that. Back to you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, we have some comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, Telesia Misuli, do you want to take the, 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 the unmute your microphone and to speak it aloud and comment it aloud? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I was just listening to Fiona and I, I really did love uh, the idea of integrated reporting. Uh, but what I'm just wondering is, uh, do we have a strategy or kind of a, a guideline on how we could uh, try to critically look into the reports that are coming from diverging contexts because we are coming from uh, quite different contexts and uh, each context uh, of higher education is uh, dealing with uh, you know different uh, problems uh, even though we're still working towards you know the shared humanity and shared value yeah that's just my concern yeah i think what needs to happen is we need to come together more. We need to get out of our silos and we need to start talking, you know, among different disciplines, among different operational and academic. Academics even need to speak more to practitioners and others to find out what's going on in the world. We all need to speak more to each other. And even on the, the boards of companies now, you know, integrated thinking emphasizes, you know, the importance of having a diverse board not just by gender, but by ethnic, but by um, also experience. So we all need to become, 
you know, learn from each other by recognizing differences, but learning that together as one, we can grow. Thank you very much for all the comments. Uh, we are uh, in time. We want to th thank you to every panelist for sharing their visions and for driving us in the reflection and for inviting us to the construction of a shared vision about ethical tasks of higher education institution in time like this. Time where higher education uh, institutions worldwide are facing several new challenges. The concept of pandemetics as a systematic human security approach to ethics uh, presented by Eugene, the need of uh, designing a new meaning of the work together and the opportunity of higher education institutions to train learners to become change makers in their own areas of expertise, the contribution of a council university for society presented by Rudolf and the proposal of an integrated reporting in higher education exposed by Fiona reinforced the idea that one of the most important ethical tasks of higher education is support and ethos of integrity in the world. Developing a new societal vision for cohabitation, we can transform lives and societies. Thank you very much to everyone for participating in this faithfully dialogue. We hope to see you tomorrow, 19 June, in the Zoom meeting of the thematic track two, Ethics and New Pedagogies. And good afternoon. Christine, want to add something more? Please, you have the floor, Christine. Oh, well, I've just um, been writing in the chat that, um, you know, we're really um, so excited to have such a rich diversity of panelists and speakers and participants. Um, this has been an intentional effort to bring an intergenerational and international group together and, um, and, and a process which will go this week and into the conference and also beyond. So the intention is really to gather up the, the to take um, stock of where we are, what our concerns are, what our proposals are, what our sense of the needs are, and to begin to build some strategies together. And so this is, uh, see this as a process and we warmly welcome you to participate actively in the conference site through the discussion forums where you can react to questions, pose your own questions. You can also read the digital papers and virtual posters which have been submitted by participants and respond to them and vote on them because there will be prizes awarded. And we have live chats coming up in the next days leading up to the conference on the, 21st, on the 25th of June. So thank you so much on behalf of globeethics.net for being with us today. And I think we all hate to cut the conversation short, but let's, um, because it's so rich and so many wonderful proposals have been put forward, but that's precisely why we've designed several moments to be together in several ways. So thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you and reading you. Um, as we go on.